Good morning, Elevating Life Church. How are you doing this morning? I'll tell you what, it is good to be with you on this. La- Some of you guys are changing seats on me. That's not fair. Oh my goodness, that's tricky, but uh, that, I'll get used to it. I'm used to seeing you certain places, but that's good. Hey, it is good to be with you on this uh, last Sunday in June, going into July. Uh, it's warm, but it's a beautiful summer, and so uh, it's good to be with you. Let me start by saying this. How many, how many of you enjoyed uh, the music, the worship? Yes. You know? What a beautiful picture of chapter one in Genesis, God's love, and that's what that's all about, where we, br- we bring uh, ourselves to God's love so that we can truly, truly get ready uh, to hear the message of what Genesis 2 is all about, God's mission. And so uh, I'm thrilled to be delivering the message this morning to you with God's uh, love in place and the completeness of what that is, the best we can anyway, uh, now to connect you with some words that will get you connected with his work or his mission in our day and age. Are you with me? Are you ready for the message? Here we go. I've got to get my mouse, that little mouse. Here it is. Man, this guy, like mouse trap all over the place. There he is. Uh, And so... Uh, so we are ready to get into the message, but before we do, let me say welcome to our visitors here uh, around uh, the the, uh, the room here, also uh, over social media. Welcome. My name is Drake. I am the senior pastor here. I'm the directing pastor. Sometimes I say I'm the bus driver responsible to navigate us from here to there to get us to the delight of the of the Lord in our day and age. So uh, that's who I am, and I'm absolutely thrilled once again, to be serving God's message this morning to His people. To His people, let me put it this way, and Carrie, you used this word several times, to His people in the movement of Christ here in Morgan County and, of course, beyond. And today we are wrapping up our mini-series about thinking like Christ. And we've used the uh, acrostic healthy thinker over the la- past 10 weeks to understand what it means to love God in our minds, with our minds, uh, as one with all of our minds. Because do you understand that our responsibility is just not be alone by ourselves? God said in the garden, it is not good for humans to be alone. And of course, He created life, Eve, if you will, and brought human life together. And that's what this is all about, so that we can live life together, fulfilling God's mission together with His uh, love driving us forward. Are you with me? Not as one all by yourself, but together as humans in the life that God has given us. There's a beautiful picture of Adam and Eve right there. Today, we are wrapping up that series. Now, to start the message, we will be in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 6 to, let me put it this way this morning, uncover how to get out of the mousetrap of man's world and into the mission, or we can say work of God. A mission where we are using our minds, we'll say personally and collectively, in the movement of Christ, we are responsible to move forward, to live abundantly through God's purpose and His order, not the other way around, in your purpose and in your mission work or your order. Now, as you're getting to Ephesians chapter 6, let me ask, as we traditionally do here, a question to set up the message this morning. Here's the question. Do you feel the demands of life are trapping you and are they destroying your personal and relational soul with God and others? Do you feel the demands of life 
are destroying your soul. Let me say this. They very well could be. Are you with me? Well, riddle me this then. Did God create you and I to be trapped in life and divided in soul, be it personally or in relationship? No, He did not. Instead, He designed us to live in connection, in relationship with Him and others to flourish. Please catch this next word, freely. That means you have a choice to do it rather than be under man's uh, you know, pressures or laws. But to freely do it in His purpose and His mission. And so many people are not doing it freely. They're doing it under oppression as we see the Israelites doing in Egypt. And that is not where we ought to be in the new covenant with Jesus Christ. And this way happens by thinking. First, with our hearts. Well, we think with our hearts and we must freely think like Christ rather than think like the world in the corrupt race of man. Our opening verse today comes from a very familiar passage for most Christians. It comes from the armor of God section found in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus and to the church overall. And our opening verse is Ephesians 6, 16, to light the candle of our message. Here, Paul and his team, of course, is writing to the church in Ephesus in the context or the framework of the armor of God. And we know this in addition to all of this, that's the armor of God in addition to all of this. Take up the shield of faith. That means you've got to get your beliefs in place with the right actions. Okay? I didn't say just believe in it. You've got to put action. And that's what Paul means here, is you've got to take up the shield of faith. Not your faith. But the faith, we see Adam and Eve living in the first two chapters of our sacred text, the Holy Bible. I didn't say chapter 3, now did I? That's the fall. That's where many of us come in. And so take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. Anybody dealt with any flaming arrows this week? <laughs> of the evil one, or can I say the rat race? The people who have been influenced by the evil one. Paul in this verse is giving resolve to the immature and or hurting Christian and or the Christian that's passive, sitting around doing nothing or on the sidelines, who lacks the wisdom of what it takes to fight the good fight in the rat race of humanity. His resolve, Paul, that is his answer, take up the shield of faith to get out of the rat race. Raise your hand if you want out of the rat race. Come on. And the title of our message this morning is exactly that. Get out of the the rat race. So join me in prayer as we get into our message this morning. Get out of the rat race. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your purpose in, in Your way, Your mission, Lord. Please forgive us for defining Your purpose in order man's way in our broken teachings and our toxic relationships, and or our bad experiences. We ask for strength by Your Spirit to grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for us to satisfy Your mission effectively. And we bow to Your beautiful and abundant reality in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Well, today, our game, 
Our game theme, of course, is a classic one, Mousetrap. It's a game I love to play as a child. Loved it. Raise your hand if, if you've ever played Mousetrap. Now let me say this. It is competitive like many games of its time, and it isn't complicated to play. As well, it doesn't take long to get trapped in the insanely competitive struggle for wealth and power in the mechanics of the game. And it is deceptive and deceitful in its ways in the game. I just remember a cute little... The whole aim of the game to be the final mouse or animal to survive. The survival of the fittest, if you will. Sound familiar, John? Survival of the fittest. It should sound familiar because it's a great representation of the rat race most Christians are trapped in today. And it's a real, let me say it this way, sad problem in the human movement that Christ developed, the new movement of human, humanity, the new human movement that Christ devised over 2,000 years ago. An activity or movement that keeps Christians out of the rat race. A race of evil that is Witness repeatedly in the Old Testament over and over. If you've ever read the Old Testament, it's a mess. The Old Testament, uh, uh, let me put it this way, a pursuit of God that went horribly wrong. Isn't it sad how many Christians are still living in the Old Testament? Think about it. Now, if you have read the Bible, by the time you read... Uh, through the entire Old Testament. Anybody, anybody read all the way through the Old Testament? You got several people. You, you pick up the Bible uh, and you read through it all. Your soul, by the time you get to Malachi, your soul should be screaming, we need a Savior. By the end of that reading, that should be what your soul cries out for. A Messiah to come to be the model and liberator to get people out of the rat race, seeing from Genesis 3, the fall to Malachi. Again, we need a Savior. Now here's the good news. That's the sad news, right? But here's the good news. The Messiah did come. Jesus did come 400 years later. And here it is. Check this out. Many repentant. Repent, Jesus says, and follow me. Many repented from the rat race to create a new pursuit that still exists today. And let me say to that, glory to God, amen, for the good news of Jesus. Who's with me? Now, back to the sad part. For those who did respond to Jesus, accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, for those who responded to Jesus and His calling, like the figures in the Old uh, Testament or Old Promise, like Adam and Eve and Jacob and Delilah and King Solomon and David, all those, like those, those folks, almost all of the Christians fell out of the new movement of Jesus to return to their old ways. You know, back to their bad habits and destructive Patterns. Some of you guys have some uh, little uh, worry energy going on. Back living in the rat race of debt, of building your little kingdom, building your little Babylon, building your tower to God. The Tower of Babel back in the Old Testament. It is sad indeed. 
So Christians today, let's see what it takes to get out of the rat race once and for all. You want to do that? The book of Ephesians is a fascinating letter. Now we're to the New Testament here. It's a fascinating letter uh, to Christians who desire to live in this movement of Christ moving forward with God's purpose and mission outside the rat race. In this book, the book of Ephesians, just to kind of give you a little overview here, in general has two halves. In the first half of Ephesians, that's chapter 1 to 3, Paul reminds the people, Christians, raise your hand if you're a Christian. He reminds us of the good news of Jesus and how he ended the rat race experienced uh, in what we see in the Old Testament. And Paul shares with those who have turned their back on the movement of Christ, objectively, turned away from that, now could be defensive Christians. Because that's turning your back on Jesus' movement. They're Peter in the garden, not Jesus, or being obedient to Jesus in the garden. And what did Jesus say to those Christians, or to that Christian? He said, get behind me, Satan. I'm not talking to them. Jesus, excuse me, Paul speaking to those people who are doing it their way because they want to chop people's ears off with their words. They want to condemn, blame. I'm not, I'm ta- Paul is talking to you, Christian, to remind you, get back to Jesus and quit acting like Peter in the garden. Are you with me? You're doing nothing, Christian, but creating more problems. Sit on your hands. See what's going on with Jesus. Because if not, you're going to be in the rat race. So Paul is reminding the Christians of Jesus and his wonderful movement in the first half. Now, in the second half, where we're going today of Ephesians, Paul shares how Christians ought to live in every part of their lives, in the new movement established by Christ. An activity or a movement where God's family connects, not only uh, at home in the household, but in the church. From Jesus to the church, to the family, to the marriage, to the individual. And it must be in that order, not the other way around, or you're living in the rat race. I'm going to live personally. And then I'll give a little bit of effort to my marriage. And then maybe to my family. And if we make it to church, maybe then we'll connect with Jesus. You're doing it wrong. You're living in the rat race. But in our pride, with our feelings, with our emotions, in the relationship, first and foremost, in our selfishness. I'm going rogue, team. (laughs) In that, we say... And we take the bait just as Adam and Eve did. We make the wrong choice. and We're in the fall for the rat race. And I say, shame on us. Get back. Come on, come back. And quit doing it your way. And so Paul is sharing in, in the third uh, and fourth and fifth, or excuse me, fourth, fifth, and sixth chapter, how Christians ought to live in this movement. And he does such a beautiful order, or he does a, such a beautiful job in communicating that we do this dwelling together through the grace and truth of Jesus, not through the guilt and shame and condemnation of man. He does a beautiful job bringing it all together for these Christians that are just not getting it any longer. And he says, you know what? He can be dramatic. I can be dramatic. But he says, you've got to do this freely. You have to make the choice to do it freely. To live in God's order, not under Caesar's hands or man's hands. Are you with me? Let me go a little deep here. Let's see what we, if we can understand. How many of you paid your taxes? We got our taxes back last week. It was all right. How many of you uh, reluctantly pay your taxes? 
Come on, I hear you griping at RBs all the time. You see, what Paul is saying and what Jesus is saying, you don't have to do, you know what, we're going to give you the freedom. We're not going to oppress you with those type of laws. What we're going to do is we're going to give you the opportunity to live with God, His family and all that, and you get to uh, freely give your tithe and offering without any pressure, with nobody stepping on your head. But isn't it amazing how many people are loyal to Caesar? But to God, go to Goodwill and go get your stuff, guy. Ooh, I'm talking about the rat race today that Christians are living today. Are you with me? I, I, I know this is convicting. It should be. <laughs> because we've got to get out of the rat race. And that's exactly what Paul is telling us in our church, in our family, and, and personally. And again, I am 100% on board, as you can sense, with Paul's writing in the Ephesians, in the end times we live. We live in the end times, folks. That means the end of the rat race. Get out. Start reading the book of Revelation a little different, and you'll know what I mean. We must understand the unique role that we Christians get to have in spreading the good news to the rat race and not live in it. In fact, we ought to marvel at it. We ought to be in awe of it. We ought to marvel at it and pray. Pray to be strengthened by God's Spirit to grasp and comprehend it, to see Christ's love, excuse me, for His people and the movement we are responsible to drive forward in our day and age. Who's with me? Now let me say this. In the second half of the book of Ephesians, again, that's chapter 4 through 6 of Paul's letter, he again shifts the gears and he starts not only sharing what it looks like to live in the mission of God, but he starts challenging the Christian, you and I to respond to the gospel with how we ought to live and live personally in light of that new movement with others. Again, others in marriage, in your households, and in the local church. Hence, the letter to the local church of Ephesus, the letter of Ephesians. The local church. We have to get back to that design. It's the local church that is going to move this Christ movement forward. Nobody else. Connect it with other church. That's the ecumenical movement. And we do that together through that process I just shared. Now quickly, <laughs> let me go down to the bottom of my notes. <laughs> Sorry. Not really. Let me say this. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, like our church, with Christ's mind as the head, is the ultimate cause, did you hear me? The ultimate cause all Christians ought to be driving forward and supporting. It's, it's amazing how many causes uh, Christians are uh, giving their money and, and resources to in the sense of our role and responsibility. It is the only cause because it is the ultimate cause, no matter what your belief is. We've got to get serious, and I've got to be straightforward with care. That's called love and, and, and straightforwardness, truth. Because the church is missing the mark. But if we can come together, we can do it. Coming together in that ultimate cause, all Christians ought to be driving forward and supporting. To do otherwise, let me say this, is to be at the, in the, the rat race of man at the track of Babylon. And if you don't know Babylon, Babylon represents being in man's world in the rat race. And Babylon is where the Tower of Babel was developed with all their little family resources and money, building with new technology like the brick, a building to God because they want to be God. It is absolutely evil. And especially when we look around in Babylon and our highest priority is building our buildings with our technology to make sure we have our reality first. And we'll build it up to God so that we can then be the power in the community. It's absolutely evil. It's unfortunate because Babylon's path has trapped many Christians thinking like the world rather than Christ. Christ who is a healthy thinker. 
in the most fantastic race ever. A new race he began over 2,000 years ago to get his people out of the rat race and into his race. And it is critical that we think like Christ if we expect to be mature and wise in our faith. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 10 weeks. We want the people to be healthy thinkers because our mental state in our culture and our society is nothing but disorder. If you don't believe me, look at the DSM. It's this thick, which now our phone book is this thick showing that our relationships no longer matter, and now the disorders or the, the, the mental disorders have taken over, and we're nothing more than the leopard in the rat race. And We've got to think like Christ if you want to get out of the disorder. Come on. If you, if you don't want, leave. But if you want to stay here with me, let's do it. We've got a problem, folks, and this is, this is the solution. So with that, over the 10 weeks, we've given you a, a reliable pattern. But for you that don't want it, I'll do what I want because I think I'm all that in a bag of Doritos with a Mountain Dew on the side. That's not for you. But for you that want to come in and be directed and led in a proper way, here it is quickly. This is what we did over the last 10 weeks, and then we're done. But I want to give you a reminder because it's critical that we start seeking God's kingdom and start thinking like Christ. And we have to have a recipe or a plan or you're going to fall all over again, just as we saw in the Old Testament. So here it is, Healthy Thinker. If you recall, 10 weeks ago we started the series. And H, if you recall, represents healthy, or excuse me, humble versus prideful thinking. And right here, we can, I can park it here, go back to 10 weeks ago, and here's the problem. When you walk away here, and you're just going to do whatever you want, that was a good message, it tickled my ear, and not apply it. You're in prideful thinking. E represents effective thinking. That means you've got to perform in the way Christ performed versus being catastrophic in your thinking, that the world is coming to an end. As you keep reading the book of Revelation your way, what we need is your world, the rat race, to come to an end and live in the end times with Jesus. A represents aimful thinking. We've got to think Genesis 1 and 2 because where there's no vision of Eden, of the promised land, people perish. So if there's no vision that's focused and grabbed onto, you're aimless, a busybody. L this was an interesting message with our church. This popped a lot of hot air around here. L represents thinking like Jesus. Rather than in your helpless way, taking things so personal, being pervasive, gossiping in your homes, and, and then making it permanent. This is never going to change. Hmm. T represents what thinking pattern? Thoughtful thinking pattern versus being a victim thinking. Please stop walking around thinking you're a victim. If anybody had the right to do that, it was Jesus. Was Jesus a victim? He was a victim. He just was not a victim thinker. Self-pity. The this. That's why I'm not the caring pastor. John is. I'm the directing pastor. Are you, are you with me? I don't have the gift of... Pastoring, that's why John is on staff. I'm the directing pastor. <laughs> okay? Come on, folks. <laughs> I, 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 try to, I try to relate to Paul. I'm just like, I don't get it. You're not a victim. Come on. Come on, Dad. Where are you? Come on. Suck it up, buttercup. That's where John comes in. <laughs> John, I need you. Brother, come here. He, he keeps things down here. So. We're not victims, folks. Folks, H represents heartfelt, okay, I just missed the mark there, but heartfelt versus overgeneralizing. And of course, why, if you remember Pastor John, he, he preached on that yes versus no thinking in the sense of yes to God's vision, his plan, and his movement, rather than just the opposite, uh, living in the rat race. And then the next aspect, and I've got to wrap this up in the next three minutes, is the pattern, uh, or excuse me, is the is the strategy or the approach you can take 
to make this happen because you've got to evaluate your thinking. You know where you're at with all of those patterns. And humble yourself and say, Phew, I'm a catastrophic thinking or perhaps I, I am a victim thinker or whatever. What? No big deal. Identify it. That's humbling yourself. And let's do something to then transform our minds so that we what can carry out the mission of God as we started this whole whole uh, series with. T represents this. Here's the recipe. Here's the strategy. You can use it. Think about your thinking. It's shared that. H represents hover over your reality or your beliefs. So some of you just need to think about your beliefs, stop them, dispute them, and change them based on God's plan and purpose and His mission. Not on your feelings, emotions, or mood. Principle. We have a faith where we live by principle. Then, enjoy the feelings, emotions, and moods of all that as an artist would with self-control. I represent, you got to identify the patterns. Going back to that. N represents, listen folks, you need some new voices in your life. Including your head. Well, I'm still listening to this person over here. Or uh, I'm going to go to this person and we're going to go to McDonald's or Arby's and we'll listen to those opinions and we'll listen to the three friends just like Job did. It doesn't work. Get some new voices. And that's what church is all about, surrounding yourself with the support that, yes, it's going to hurt sometimes because, uh, again, being the lead doctor, you're going to come in. And I'm like, you got a broken leg here, spiritually speaking, and I I'm going to give you some new voice to that and I'm going to pop your leg back in and guess what you're going to say? Ouch, I hate your stinking guts, Pastor! <laughs> Anybody ever done that? To it? I did that? That's exactly what happened. Then when they don't understand it in the sake of service, they think you're doing it for whatever reason. They take it personally, and then they're pervasive about it, and they're not thinking like this. Get new friends. Get new reality, wherever you go. Get to church. Okay. Guess what? We've got to know Christ's teachings found in the gospel. The way we teach it here, 49th commands of Christ. Before you do anything, before you start, I'm going to study my Bible, you need to learn the commands of Christ and get Jesus' voice in your head. That's our faith. No, no, I'm going to listen to Craig Rochelle. I love Craig, hero of mine, friend of mine. I'm going to, no, you need to, voice of Jesus in your head, and the only way to do that is to get the commands, A, B, C, D, into your head. And if they're not there, you're in the rat race. You fit in that big, big book called the DSM, the Disorders. We've got to get new voices, and we get to voices that are mature in that, and we follow them as we follow Christ. E is confusing, but it makes sense. Ego talk. Once you're a Christian, your ego belongs to God, yes? Your dignity, your self-worth, your self-respect. Start speaking to yourself as Jesus would speak to you. Again, while you have to get the voice of Jesus and those who really have your back and want the very best for you in your head. Quit listening to your... I don't want to do that. Self-talk. And the last one, as John preached a couple of weeks ago, and we're done, is results. Jesus, God only thinks on His results. And we've got to get this understood because that is our vision. He is our reward. And we only think focused on the fruits of the Spirit. And if the fruits of the Spirit are not your focus in, in your relationship and what you do, it's back to the rat race. You see, once we figure this all out and we can truly, truly, truly understand what that all means, and we get out of our immaturity, we put our clothes on of Christ, now we're ready for the armor of God to fight. Everybody in their youth wants to put on the armor. No. We put on the armor of God when we're growing and developing with family and church, and then you're going to put the armor of God on to stand firm. Exactly where Paul brings this in Ephesians 6, verse 13 through 16. He wraps up, and I'm going to wrap up this whole message with this. Therefore, 
put on the full armor of God. Now we're thinking. Now we got the clothes or the identity of Christ on, of God, so that when the day of evil comes, those, that influence that we see in the garden, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, Pastor, I've done everything. Good. So stand, guess what? Stand some more. Quit your whining. <laughs> stand firm then with the belt of truth. That truth represents God's reality. Buckled around your race with the breastplate of righteousness, that's right living, in place, and with your, follow me, help me up, there you go, and with your feet, that's action, fit it with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, God's order, his mission, and then, of course, we end with where we started. In addition to all of this, Paul says, take up the shield of faith, believe properly, make sure you take the right action, that with which you can extinguish all the fiery arrows that are going to come to you in college, in your, in your communities, and where all the rat race or Babylon exists, so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the... starting with your mind. Let me encourage you, Christian, as Paul does. Let me say this, Jesus is the way. But the mission comes the second part of Ephesians. Do all you can to apply that to your life. To get out of the rat race. The message, get out of the rat race. Amen?